Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to start reading through this really cool magazine called 100 Greatest Mysteries Revealed and it's by National Geographic. All this month of December I'm doing viewer requested topics and I actually had a couple people say I should do mysteries from history or geography and I found this magazine at the grocery store the other day and I was like, perfect. I also checked out a book at my library about history mysteries. It just came in so I haven't seen it yet. So we'll see if that one's any good either, but this magazine is so cool. Let's just dive right in. 100 Greatest Mysteries Revealed. We're gonna do the Civilizations chapter. Look at the Nazca. So there are 25 in this chapter. Number one, what is the meaning of the Karnak stones? Squish this down so you can see everything. More than 3,000 standing stones scored by the wind and rain, scoured, there we go, scoured by the wind and rain into hundred shapes, form long avenues near the French village of Karnak made from both the single stones, known as meniers, and multi-stone groups, known as dolmens, they stretch for some two miles. Though the stones have stood for thousands of years, archaeologists have not traced their purpose or origins. The megaliths have been recognized as sacred by successive waves of Breton culture. Ancient Romans carved their gods on the granite surfaces. Christians later added their own symbols. According to one legend, the Meniers are the rocky remains of an army of pagans who chased St. Cornelli, Cornelli toward the seas, concerned he turned his pursuers into stone. In truth, the stones are far older than Christianity, and most likely date to Brittany's pre-Celtic Neolithic period, from about 4500 BCE to 2000 BCE. Were they raised in tribute to ancient gods? Did they honor ancestors? Do they track alignments of the sun or stars? So far, the gray armies have kept their secret. Number two. How did the ancient Egyptians build the Great Pyramid? The Great Pyramid at Giza, raised as a tomb for the pharaoh Khufu around 2560 BCE, is the last of the ancient seven wonders of the world still standing. Egyptian architects most likely employed tens of thousands of workers to transport its 2.3 million limestone blocks, weighing an average of 2.5 tons apiece. How did they lift and place the heavy blocks on an increasingly tall building? Theories about the methods used to build the Great Pyramid range from cranes, there is not enough wood in all Egypt to provide these, to extraterrestrials. Most scenarios involve a ramp. A straight ramp would have to have been at least a mile long to reach the pyramid's top without being too steep, and there is no evidence for such a structure. A winding ramp around the outside would not have allowed engineers to measure the corners, which would have been necessary if they were to meet neatly at the top. In 2007, researchers found a tantalizing clue cosmic ray scanning, known as muon radiography, detected a void in the structure at least 100 feet long. Could it be an internal ramp used to drag stones into place? It's all still conjecture. Number three. What was the purpose of Stonehenge? It was a druid's place of worship and human sacrifice. It was a temple for healing, assembled by giants. It was a vast solar observatory, the capital of Bronze Age, British culture, a monument to multiple gods, or a sacred site of the ancestral dead. All these meanings and more have been assigned to Stonehenge, the famous circle of stones on England's Salisbury Plain. Many of these theories have subsequently been disproved, but the monument's purpose is still a mystery. We do know that Stonehenge is far older than the Druids. 
built-in stages between about 3000 BCE and 1520 BCE. It apparently began as circles of earthen mounds and timber uprights. In 2021, archaeologists uncovered the remains of what appears to be the original Stonehenge, dismantled at the site of Wong Mon, Wales. Shout out to all my Welsh viewers who know how to pronounce that. I do not. Up to 80 bluestone blocks, weighing several tons each, were transported somehow from Wales, a distance of 160 miles. An outer circle of sandstone sarsens, weighing up to 50 tons, was quarried 20 to 30 miles away on the Marlborough Downs and set in place around 2500 BCE. The circle is aligned to the midsummer and midwinter solstices, but seems otherwise not to have an astronomical function. It's possible that the site was intended for ancestor worship, though evidence is still scarce. Number four, who were the Terim mummies? I'm assuming Terim? I'm not sure. I've never heard of these before, but they're really cool. Early in the 20th century, archaeologists reported an astonishing find. In northwest China, on the edge of the pitiless Talikmakan Desert, they covered the preserved bodies of what, to all appearances, were Eurasians. Buried in the Terim River Basin near a dry riverbed, these naturally mummified bodies had long, blonde to brown hair. Some were close to 4,000 years old. At least one group, buried in what is known as the Small River Cemetery, wore woolen capes and felt caps with jaunty feathers, like alpine hikers. Curiously, they were interred in overturned boats, above which long oar-like poles were struck into the ground. Possibly, researchers suggested phallic symbols. Long thought to be migrants, these mummies were in fact very much ancestrally at home in the harsh Terim Basin. In 2021, DNA analysis revealed the mummies descended from a highly isolated Ice Age population known as Ancient North Eurasians. Researchers have searched for evidence of this population in the Holocene in an effort to find a genetic link to modern people living in the same area. While their environment may have insulated the group genetically, they did exchange culturally with their neighbors. Number five, what happened to the Indus Valley civilization? Three great civilizations dominated the ancient world, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the Indus Valley culture. Mesopotamia and Egypt evolved over time conquerors and conquered, merging with other cultures. Unlike Mesopotamia and Egypt, however, the Indus Valley civilization, the largest of the three, collapsed and vanished, and no one knows why. Flourishing between about 2500 BCE and 1700 BCE, the Indus Valley people occupied land in what is now mainly Pakistan on the Indian subcontinent, the civilization benefited from the highly fertile land of the Indus River floodplain and trade from nearby Mesopotamia. Two large cities, Harappa and Mahenjadaro, testified to their sophistication and central planning. They were farmers, traders, and artisans. The culture was literate with an elaborate script that remains largely undeciphered. Such a civilization seemed poised to spread through the fertile regions around it. Yet around 1900 BCE, the great city of Mahendradara was wiped out by invaders. And, according to recently analyzed river sediment in the Arabian Sea, heavy monsoons during an Arctic freeze may have driven the civilization into the hills. Number six. What was written on the Phaistos disc? Here it is here. In 1908, Italian archaeologist Luigi Pernier found a six-inch fired clay disc in the ruins of the ancient palace of Phaistos on the Greek island of Crete. Dating to perhaps 1700 BCE, the time of the Minoan Bronze Age on the island, the disc bears a spiral of stamped symbols that have so far defied translation. 
The fact that symbols are stamped may suggest a capacity for mass production, although no other discovery supports that. The 242 signs, consisting of 45 unique stamps, are grouped into 61 segments. Many have recognizable shapes, such as a tattooed head, an arrow, a plane tree, a cat, and a beehive. They may represent phon phonetic groups or syllables, but there are too few of them to be deciphered. No other artifact has ever been found with the same symbols. Attempts to unravel its mystery. Cretan, foreign, syllabic reading inward, alphabetic reading outward, are as varied as its interpreters. A few experts believe the disc is a hollow... <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying not to take with my Tourette's. A few experts believe the disc is a hoax or forgery, but most accept it as genuine. Like other remnants of the enigmatic early Minoan culture, it continues to hold its secrets. Meanwhile, speaking of the Minoans, number seven, did a volcano destroy the Minoans? When British archaeologist Arthur Evans uncovered the intricate ruins of an ancient palace on the island of Crete in 1900, he remembered the legend of King Minos. According to Greek mythology, the tyrannical Cretan ruler regularly fed young Athenians to the half-man, half-bull minotaur he kept imprisoned at the center of a labyrinth. Although Minos, his creature, and his labyrinth may never have existed, Evans's discovery showed that a great pre-Hellenic culture had indeed once thrived on the Aegean island, and he named it the Minoan Civilization. The Minoans flourished from roughly 2700 BCE to 1450 BCE. Literate and artistic, they commanded trading networks throughout Europe and the Near East. Their civilization came to an abrupt end, however. The great palaces at Knossos and elsewhere were destroyed, and Cretan culture vanished. The reasons are still hotly debated. Around this time, a volcano on the nearby island of Thera erupted. Did an earthquake, volcanic ash, a tsunami, or some combination of these bring down the Minoan palaces? Or did Mycenaean armies invade? a theory supported by the appearance of Mycenaean artifacts after this period. Could the Minoans have been pulled down from within by an insurrection? Or was it a combination of several factors? Natural disasters that weakened the culture and armies that gave it the death blow. Despite a wealth of material, for now the Minoans are keeping their secrets. Number eight, are there hidden treasures in the Egyptian city of Tanis? Tanis may be the most spectacular archaeological site you've never heard of. Fans of Raiders of the Lost Ark might recognize it as the buried city that supposedly held the Ark of the Covenant. Readers of the Old Testament may know it as Zoan, where Moses was said to work miracles. Today it is known as San El Hagar. But the real historical city of Tanis, capital of 21st Dynasty Egypt, was lost to the world for roughly 2,000 years. Once located on the Nile Delta, it vanished beneath the sands when the river shifted its course. No one knew where to find it or just what lay within. European investigators began to uncover portions of the city by the 19th century, but the most spectacular finds came in 1939, when French archaeologist Pierre Monte uncovered a royal tomb complex holding golden masks, jewelry, silver coffins, and other treasures rival rivaling those of King Tut. Sadly for Monte, World War II intervened and eclipsed his discoveries. Though some of Tanis' treasures can now be found in Cairo's Egyptian Museum, scientists know there is more to be found. Infrared satellite imagery reveals more buildings waiting to be uncovered. Number 9. What will be found in the buried city of Petra? Travelers seeking the eastern entrance of Petra, the ancient city in Jordan's southwestern corner, 
must wend their way through one of the most dramatic approaches in the world, a 250-foot high slot canyon known as the Seek. At the canyon's end are the immense pillars of the treasury, which is actually a temple, carved into the sandstone cliff. Inside, a small tomb. Once an immensely wealthy city, Petra is now largely hidden under sand and debris. Petra was founded by the Nabataeans, Arab nomads who settled in the area and made it into a center of trade for perhaps 1,000 years, from about 300 BCE to 700 CE. Clever water systems allowed for public baths and lush gardens in the desert. Romans moved in around the 2nd century CE, after which the city began to decline, until most of its villas, theaters, and temples had vanished, and its original inhabitants were forgotten. In 2016, satellite surveys revealed the most impressive structure yet, a monumental platform hiding in plain sight. Number 10. Were the bog bodies victims of human sacrifice? They are some of the world's best preserved murder victims. Bog bodies have been unearthed in peaty wetlands across northern Europe, in Denmark, the British Isles, Germany, and the Netherlands. Some have been reduced to skeletons, but many are in a remarkable state of natural mummification, with skin intact down to the last worry line. Pickled by the acidic, oxygenless conditions of certain bogs, the bodies represent a wide range of eras from 2000 BCE to the 20th century, but most date to the Iron Age, roughly 2,500 years ago. These were not unlucky hikers who happened to stumble into a boggy trap. Most had been bludgeoned, stabbed, or hanged, like the Danish Toland man, buried with a leather noose still tight around his neck. Here he is. Toland man, probably like the most famous bog body. Lacking written records, archaeologists have been reduced to speculation about the intent behind these murders. Perhaps the victims were particularly despised criminals. Many researchers, however, now believe that the ritual killings were human sacrifices to gods or goddesses. Bodies found in Ireland, for example, often bear marks of status, such as jewelry, and are dismembered and interred along boundary lines between kingdoms. New chemical analysis of the well-preserved skin and clothing on two Danish bog bodies revealed they may have been revered travelers, with atoms from food and clothing fibers, likely from northern Scandinavia. So what's next? Number 11. What is hidden in the emperor's tomb? China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huangdi, wielded power as only a despot can. Uniting China's warring states in 221 BCE, the emperor standardized weights and measures and built roads, canals, and defensive walls throughout his realm. He also burned books and executed scholars. His most monomaniacal project, however, was his own legacy. Obsessed with immortality, the emperor conscripted some alleged 700,000 laborers to build a city-like tomb guarded by a vast terracotta army. Thousands of these warriors, each vividly painted, have been uncovered by archaeologists. Half-sized bronze horses and chariots have also been unearthed, along with valuable artifacts made of silk, linen, jade, and bone. Craftsmen, concubines, and sacrificed slaves were buried in the compound as well, and the workmen who built it were killed to preserve its secrets. According to Han Dynasty historian Sima Chan, the tomb contains wonders, a scale model of the entire empire, complete with birds of gold and silver, flowing rivers of mercury, and a map of the sky with constellations of pearls. In 2016, using remote sensing, ground-penetrating radar, and core sampling, scientists revealed the grand scale of the complex, encompassing nearly 38 square miles. 
the emperor himself has not been uncovered, and it is unclear if he ever will be, which would no doubt satisfy the autocratic ruler. Number 12. Who built Teotihuacan? The unknown builders of the great city of Teotihuacan seemed determined to leave no clues to their identity. Begun around 100 BCE on the Mexican plateau, the city rapidly became the largest metropolis in the Western Hemisphere, covering eight square miles and housing between 80,000 and 100,000 inhabitants. Streets were laid out on a grid, bisected by the broad Avenue of the Dead. The tremendous Pyramid of the Sun and Pyramid of the Moon towered over wide roads, temples, residential compounds, and workshops. For all of this, the industrious folk who raised the city left behind no record of their language or origins. Even the city's mellifluous name was bestowed by a later culture, the Aztecs. As it prospered, Teotihuacan seems to have drawn immigrants from other cultures, including the Maya and Mixtec. Daily life may have involved routine brutality. Skeletons in the temples appear to be ritual sacrifices. Even combs, buttons, and needles were made from freshly harvested human bone. As mysteriously as it arose, the city was destroyed, burned, and abandoned in the 7th century CE. Invaders may have been responsible, but some researchers note that most of the burned buildings belonged to the upper classes. Teotihuacan may have fallen from civil war or from a brutal dissolution of an allyship. See number 13. Could Palenque solve Maya mysteries? There we go. Researchers are still filling in the blanks about the rise and fall of the great Maya civilization, despite the wealth of written records the Maya left behind. Some of these records have been found at the Mexican site of Palenque, a stately city of stone temples and plazas that flourished from about 200 CE to 900 CE. The construction of elite buildings halted in 800 CE, and a gradual population decline followed. Abandoned to the jungle for hundreds of years, Palenque's structures, particularly the stair-stepped Temple of Inscriptions, contain extensive carved, glyph carved glyphic texts. Wow, why was that so hard to say? carved glyphic texts. The first Europeans reached the Yucatan Peninsula in the 16th century, however. Oh, however, no one remained who could read the texts. Ham-fisted investigations did not help matters. In the 1780s, Colonel Antonio del Rio began his search of Palenque's palace by smashing through its walls. More recently, though, scholars have begun to unravel the complex glyphs after entering the tomb of Maya ruler Pakal, found within the Temple of Inscriptions. In the 1970s, archaeologists at Palenque managed to decode a list of kings. Today, about 90% of the glyphs have been deciphered, revealing a complex logographic script in which symbols could represent either syllables or words. Number 14, what's the purpose of the Nazca Lines? You can see one of them down here. So cool. 2,000 years ago, people etched more than a thousand outsized figures in the coastal desert of southwestern Peru. Quadrangles, trapezoids, spirals, narrow lines, and outlines suggesting the shapes of giant creatures stretch across hundreds of square miles of arid plateaus, concentrated between the towns of Nazca and Palpa. In the 1920s, trans-Andean pilots rediscovered the enormous geoglyphs, prompting decades of research to answer the question, what are they for? Many answers have been suggested and discarded over the years. We know that the markings were created primarily by the Nazca culture, which flourished from about 200 BCE to 600 CE. Students of the figures have theorized that they represent irrigation lines, an astronomical calendar, Inca roads, icons to be viewed from archaic hot air balloons, and 
in the most persistent and improbable notion, spaceports for alien aircraft. Today's leading explanation is simpler. The glyphs may have formed ceremonial pathways in a holy landscape. Many of the figures are associated with rain or fertility, and traces of footprints can still be seen along the lines. So number 15. Is the Bighorn Medicine Wheel an astronomical calendar? Found in the oral traditions of Native American tribes, including the Crow and Blackfeet, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel is a place of ancient legend. The 75-foot-wide stone circle is located at the top of Medicine Mountain, 9,642 9, feet up in Wyoming's Bighorn Mountain Range. Over the winter, it is buried under impassable snow. The wheel is a sacred Native American site, probably constructed by indigenous peoples of the Great Plains about 700 years ago. It is best known of more than 100 similar wheels found in the United States and Canada. At the Bighorn Wheel Center is a stone cairn from which radiate 28 rocky spokes. Six more cairns are positioned around the circumference. No records exist to tell us of its original purpose, but the wheel's alignment is suggestive. The line from one cairn through the hub marks sunrise at the summer solstice. The line from another cairn marks sunset on the same day. Other alignments track the rising of the bright stars Sirius, Aldebaran, and Rigel, important in the legends of several indigenous peoples. The 28 spokes may represent the 28 days in the lunar calendar. The wheel makes an impressive astronomical calendar. Number 16. Were America's first colonists Vikings? For generations, school children were taught in 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue, marking the discovery of North America. Even after First Nations reclaimed historical truths going back thousands of years, and a nationwide reckoning took place with the narrative, the Italian navigator was hailed as the first European to reach the continent. Dissenters, however, have pointed to an alternate theory. According to medieval Norse sagas, the enterprising Viking Leif Erikson set sail from Greenland in the year 1000 and reached a lush, grassy land to the west rich with timber, salmon, and grapes. Other Norse family soon joined him in Vinland, where they began to clash with the natives they denigrated as Skraelings. This account was met with skepticism until 1960, when two Norwegian explorers, Helga and Anna Ingstad, began to uncover the remains of a colony at Lonzo Meadows in Newfoundland, Canada. Buried within the confines of eight buildings, were Norse artifacts, including a lamp, a spindle, and iron boat nails. In 2021, scientists thrillingly pinpointed the year Vikings settled, exactly a millennium before, in the year 1021. A rare solar storm marked the last tree ring of wood used to build the settlement. Number 17. What's the meaning of the Great Serpent Mount? More than 1,300 feet long, about 20 to 25 feet wide, and 4 to 5 feet high, the Great Serpent Mound undulates across the hills of southern Ohio, the largest effigy mound in the world. Its tail ends in an elegant coil, and its head seems to be swallowing a giant egg. Who built it and what it means are still unknown. You can see it here in the picture. Big, sneaky... First described in the 1840s, the sinuous mound was originally attributed to the ancient Adena people, who inhabited the area from about 500 BCE to 200 CE, and whose remains are found in nearby burials. Radiocarbon dating has suggested that it is younger, perhaps about 900 years old, from the time of the Fort Ancient people. The Fort Ancient culture was influenced by the Mississippian culture, which featured rattlesnakes in much of its iconography. 
Indeed, many Native American cultures imbued serpents with spiritual power. Some archaeologists point out that the serpent mound's head aligns with the summer solstice, so it may have had an astronomical or ceremonial purpose. In the absence of any artifacts or written records, however, the mound may remain a vast serpentine enigma. Number 18. Will we ever understand Easter Island's art and writing? Easter Island, Rapa Nui in the language of its people, is one of the most isolated, populated spots on Earth. More than a thousand years ago, its inhabitants raised hundreds of multi-ton monoliths, known as moai, that have fascinated archaeologists since their discovery some 300 years ago. Carved primarily from volcanic tuff with hand tools, the statues were transported somehow to positions on stone platforms. What was their purpose? How did people move the monoliths? Easter Islanders said the statues walked. Some writers claimed the Moai could only have been positioned by lost civilizations or extraterrestrials. More scholarly sources suggested they could have been hauled on frames. Recently, archaeologists have shown that the Easter Islanders might have had it right. The statues walked. A couple of dozen people, using ropes, can rock a moai from side to side on its curved base and walk it forward. By the time European explorers arrived, many of the moai were toppled and their meaning lost to memory. They may have been symbols of power between warring groups. They may have had a peaceful religious purpose. Wooden and stone tablets found here are also a mystery. They contain an undeciphered Rongo Rongo script. The curious glyphs run left to right, then right to left when the tablet is upended. Like the statues, the script has so far defied explanation. Look how amazing that is. Number 19. Where is Genghis Khan's tomb? In his day, he was the terror of the world. Genghis Khan built an army of ruthless horsemen and swept across Asia and into Europe in the 13th century, slaughtering entire cities and building pyramids of skulls. At its height, his empire spanned 12 million square miles, from the Mediterranean to the Yellow Sea. The Mongol leader bred as efficiently as he fought. Today, about 16 million people carry genes that can probably be traced to the conqueror. When Genghis Khan died in 1227, he vanished, and the location of his tomb has been one of history's best-kept secrets. Apparently, he wanted it that way. Although legend has it that the leader was taken back to his homeland in Mongolia for an elaborate burial, some versions also state that the ground was then trampled by horses and planted with trees to hide the tomb's presence, after which the burial procession murdered anyone who might track their route. Explorers are now using non-invasive techniques to survey the landscape from the air in hopes of identifying ancient structures such as burial mounds. So far, the land has kept the remains of the world's greatest conqueror well hidden. Let's see, it says, fireplace stone, so it was a camp here. That's not a tomb. <laughs> Number 20. Was Machu Picchu a sacred site? Hiram Bingham, the explorer who brought the Peruvian site of Machu Picchu to the world's attention in 1913, called it the Lost City of the Incas. He believed the complex of stone palaces, temples, storehouses, and dwellings might have been the one-time city of Vilcabamba, where Inca rulers fought a losing battle against Spanish invaders. Or else, Bingham argued, it was the home of Virgins of the Sun, holy women dedicated to the Inca sun god. More recent research has dashed Bingham's romantic theories. Machu Picchu was certainly an Inca city, but not Vilcabamba, and no trace of sacred virgins has been found. Given that the Inca left no written records, however, Archaeologists are still uncertain of the mountainous city's purpose or inhabitants. 
On the one hand, theories suggest that the steeply terraced buildings may have been built as a retreat for the great Inca Emperor Pachacuti in the 15th century. On the other hand, the site does appear to be a holy one, enclosed by the sacred Urubamba River and aligned to the solstices. Machu Picchu may have been a site of spiritual pilgrimage, or possibly both, a royal residence and a sacred destination. Researchers continue to excavate the site, hoping to find clues to the impressive city's inhabitants and the reason for its abandonment in the 1570s. Number 21. What is the meaning of the Voynich Manuscript? The Voynich Manuscript is both a codebreaker's delight and bane. The 240-page vellum work is written in an unknown language and contains hundreds of inked illustrations of astrological symbols, unidentifiable plants, and bizarre human figures. Legions of cryptographers, including some of the best in the world, have tried and failed to decipher the manuscript's lettering. Is it an herbal manual? An alchemical guide? No one knows. The manuscript is named after the Polish-American bookseller Wilfred Voynich, who bought it in 1912, but its provenance is much older. The work dates back at least to the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II of Germany, who acquired it for 600 gold ducats, believing it to be the work of medieval scholar Roger Bacon. The seller may have been the notorious English astronomer and student of the occult, John Dee, who had a collection of Bacon's works. The manuscript then passed through various other European owners, none of whom could make sense of it. Claims of decipherment continue, including one currently under debate. Recent tests show that it dates to the early 15th century. Today, the Voynich manuscript resides in Yale's Beinecke Library. Number 22. Does a Florentine wall hide a lost da Vinci? In 1502, Florentine politician Piero Soderini commissioned Leonardo da Vinci to paint a mural in Florence's Palazzo Vecchio. The final painting, depicting the victory of Tuscan forces at the Battle of Angiari, was huge, as much as 20 feet long and 10 feet high. Da Vinci was not happy with it, however. Experimenting with oil paints on the wall of the Hall of the 500, the artist found that the colors ran and blurred. He abandoned the mural unfinished. Many viewers were impressed by the dramatic battle scene, and when the hall was remodeled, artist Giorgio Vasari was hired to paint over da Vinci's work. Some scholars think that Vasari, an admirer of da Vinci's work, built a false wall to protect it and painted his own mural on top. In 2012, art historian Maurizio Saracini inserted a tiny camera into a crack in the wall and detected a hollow space and black pigment behind Vasari's mural. The investigation is on hold, leaving its fate an open question, with some historians now claiming the masterpiece was never painted in the first place. Number 23. This is a big page. What, what are the sources of the Piri Reis map? I have no idea how to pronounce that. <laughs> Haji Ahmed Muhuddin Piri, better known now as Piri Reis, Reis, or Captain Piri, was an accomplished Turkish admiral and map maker of the 16th century. Cartographers and lost civilization enthusiasts know him primarily as the creator of a beautiful 1513 map. Lost for many years, the map was rediscovered in the 20th century and is now held in Istanbul's Topkapi Palace. It seems to represent just part of the original document, given some references to Asia found in the writing, but unfortunately the rest of the map has vanished. It may be the oldest surviving map to show the Americas. Here we go. For cartographers, the map is remarkable for its detailed rendering of the coast of South America only two decades after European discovery. 
For those with a more imaginative bent, the document is said to show land masses, including Antarctica, unknown at the time, and therefore the map must have been created thousands of years earlier by an unknown advanced civilization. The claim derives mainly from the fact that the map's South American coastline veers far to the east, almost as if tracing the northern edge of Antarctica. However, closer examination shows that the coast is quite different from that of Antarctica, and the latitude is thousands of miles astray. Piri Reyes notes on the map that he compiled it from many sources, including Portuguese explorers, and it seems likely that those sources were simply too sparse to be accurate. However, the document does contain information that in theory was unknown at the time, including the presence of an interior mountain range in South America. The true mystery may be who charted these details and why is history forgotten these early explorers? Number 24. Will we ever find El Dorado? The first El Dorado was a man, not a city. Spanish explorers to South America heard his legend early in the 1500s. Somewhere in the Andes, they were told, the indigenous Muisca people would initiate a new chief by dusting him with gold from head to foot and tossing gold and emeralds into a sacred lake. Besotted with greed, Spanish, German, Portuguese, and English adventurers ventured into the unforgiving wilds of Colombia, Guyana, and Brazil, and anywhere else that sounded promising, in search of this mythic treasure. Over time, El Dorado was transformed in the telling from a man into a valley paved with gold, just waiting for discovery. Among the adventurers were Sir Walter Raleigh, whose son Watt died in the attempt in 1617, and who was himself executed upon his return to Europe for disobeying the king's instructions. Many people, both Native American and Europeans, died in these brutal quests. No golden trove was ever found. There may be some truth to the legend, however. The lake mentioned in the Muisca story may be Laguna Guatavita, high in the Andes near Bogota, Colombia. Some golden objects and jewels have been dredged from that body of water and another nearby, but attempts to drain the lake and recover the reputed riches have all failed. Whatever treasures drowned there remains undisturbed. And the last one tonight. Who owned the Jamestown slate? It's as if archaeologists of the future discovered the last few pages of a notepad of today the faint impressions of doodles, grocery lists, musings, and schoolwork overlaid on the paper. In 2009, excavations in an old well in Jamestown, Virginia, America's first permanent European settlement, uncovered a colonial-era slate tablet covered with overlapping, scratched inscriptions. They include drawings of a man with a roughed collar, what appears to be a palmetto tree, and words reading either a minion of the finest sort, a minion or minion, being either a servant or canon, or the more modest, I am none of the finest sort. The slates, marks, and original owner or owners remain a mystery. The palmetto tree suggests that the artist had been traveling south of Jamestown. He may have even been William Strachey, who survived a shipwreck in Bermuda to become the colony's first secretary. The well in which the tablet was found was dug around 1608 to 1610 under the orders of John Smith, Jamestown's leader, and was made into a trash pit after it became brackish and unusable. Colonial trash is an archaeologist's treasure, and the discarded slate is a particularly valuable find. And check it out, you can see this guy and his collar and everything. That's pretty cool. But anyway, that is it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night.